Hello, everybody. Welcome to our CTO Brown Bag session. And right now, today, we have Shantana and Yoni with us. Uh, uh, Yoni and Shantana, would you do, uh, do a quick intro before we get started? Everyone, happy to. Uh, hey, I'm Yoni. I'm the uh, CTO of AppSolver. Hi, I'm Shantana. I'm a product manager for developer experience at AppSolver. Great, great. Okay, so previously we talked about orchestration. So you haven't, if you haven't checked that out yet, we'll link it below. Um, and today we're going to talk about state management, uh, state uh, store, and state management in streaming data. So this is a, a very, I guess, a big topic, <laughs> and we can deep dive to really, really technical. But I think, um, you know, um, for this, uh, for the sake of this uh, this discussion, since we only have thirty minutes, we want to keep this interesting for you all, and um, and uh, try to um, have Yoni answer some of the questions uh, of uh, what's uh, happening with the state management today, uh, in the past, and in the future. Um, and by, by state management, I just want to clarify very quick before we get started, we're not talking about distributed system state management, we're talking about data, uh, streaming data, state management uh, and state store. Um, and uh, this is, um, and so this goes kind of segues to our first question is that for folks that are very new to streaming data, and they've been working with bash data in the past, Yoni, would you kind of um, give us uh, some background on uh, why state management and store is needed uh, in in streaming data and how is that different from traditional batch data processing? Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, let's frame the problem here. Like, what are we trying to solve? Um, I have a stream of events and this stream of events has a user ID in it. And I want to know where this user lives and I want to enrich my stream of events with the user's address or with the user's country or whatever it is, something about the user. Um, and, and that information came from somewhere else. It's not obviously in my event. I just have the user ID. Um, it's probably going to be stored in uh, some kind of a data storage database, data warehouse, whatever it is, um, key value store. Um, it's going to be coming in possibly from a different stream of events that has all of these updates, or maybe it's being written uh, in a completely different process. But I mean, the problem that I'm trying to solve is that essentially I want to get take this ID and enrich it with additional data. And this is a very broad problem. Like a lot of data uh, modeling problems uh, boil down to this kind of like enrichment use case. So, I mean, it could be that I want to uh, take uh, get, uh, enrich data from a user. I want to enrich data from just a separate stream or join between two streams. I want to uh, look at the history of the current stream to see how many times this event happened in the past. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to slice it. But in the end, it's like I want to take information that's um, kind of like an aggregate over um, all the data that I got in the last X amount of time or forever and and pull that piece of data relevant to some kind of ID uh, into my stream for, for downstream processing. Um, so that's like kind of the very broad uh, uh, category level definition. And in batch processing, you can kind of sidestep it because often you can just say, well, let's join between the user's stream that I'm going to be updating once a day and the, uh, and the user event stream. And, and it, it'll just run, it'll join the two large tables and it'll take a lot of processing behind the scenes, but it'll just work. Uh, and, and, and you end up with your, with your joined data. Um, and that's it. And you're done. And that's that's easy. Uh, I mean, that just uh, that just works. And uh, so, in a batch use case, the fact that I like the fact that I can join two large states in batch, um, and I'm allowed for that join to take a very long time. Um, so, so let's say if I have on the one side ten billion records, on the other side five billion records, and I want to join the two, the the complexity of that is basically on the order of ten billion plus five billion. So, so I'm not I'm not doing anything that's that's more than essentially scanning all of my data. And since the state isn't that much bigger than the amount of data that came in in a day, anyways, um, I'm not I'm not increasing the amount of processing I have to do by by a, by a huge amount. Um, when you go to streaming, things change completely because uh, if I were to take every event, or I were to take a micro batch, let's say I have a hundred events now that I want to enrich. Uh, and I have to scan 5 billion rows. And then the next 100 events, I again have to scan 5 billion rows. So I'm suddenly, uh, the amount of scanning that I have to do is, is completely unreasonable, uh, depending on the size of my state. 
Um, any any questions so far, or anything that, uh, that 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 wasn't clear? By the way. So the root of the issue is that for one, you have two static things, so it's like as you said, one number plus the other. And in the streaming case, we have a uh, outer product problem, right? Like you have every single entity here has to be sir has to be cross reference against everything in here. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like from a very technical database perspective, it's like I can do a merge join in a in a batch process, and I have to do a hash join in a, in a streaming process. Um, but but yeah, exactly. Like you nailed it. So it's, I mean, this is kind of the root of the issue that that suddenly, it, whereas in a batch process, and by the way, and if if my batch process join takes too long for whatever reason. I can just increase the interval of the of the of the job. So I can say, well, I'm not going to run it every hour. I'll run it every day, and then and then I have to do uh, one divided by 24 the amount of work because um, the amount of work is fixed. I mean, I need to load a state which is pretty much the same size all the time. Um, so so reducing the interval just reduces the amount of work. And this is, by the way, the same for like you know uh, like uh, data lake systems. It's also the same for data warehouses. Um, and then when you go to uh, databases, then you don't necessarily have this problem because you can create an index on a table. And then your join can actually do a hash join into the, uh, into the table, and it's very fast. So I can do a join for a single record very quickly. Whereas if you're looking at large distributed systems, data warehouses, data lakes, um, generally you're going to have to scan the entire table in order to do the join, even if you're only joining to a single record or like 100 records or something like that. Um, so that's where the problem of state management comes from. You're in a streaming context. You need to be able to do your hash joins. Um, so I need to put my hash table somewhere. And where is it going to sit? Um, there isn't kind of a traditional data warehouse or data lake solution for that. So if you're working in Spark, you're going to have like Spark has its own kind of internal state um, that it knows how to build and distribute. Um, but it's, it's kind of like very, let's say, uh, naive uh, or primitive. Um, if you want to get like kind of a bit more, like have more resiliency and being able to hold a bit more data, so you're going to be using some kind of key value store, like uh, Cassandra or uh, um, uh, Redis or uh, like a bunch of other that essentially do the same thing, that you insert data into it and then you can get by key and the get by key is very fast and you can do tens or hundreds of thousands of get by keys per second. Um, so you have your state store. It's this um, key value store NoSQL database, um, and it lives somewhere. And you have your Spark cluster, which is uh, running your streaming transformation, um, uh, uh, rather Spark streaming cluster that's running your streaming transformation. And, uh, and, and then every event that comes in, it does a hash join, it does a join, a lookup into the NoSQL, uh, gets the response and continues with its life. And and since the NoSQL supports tens, hundreds of thousands, even millions of requests per second, you can support high velocity streaming data uh, into that. Um, so that's, let's say, the, the beginning of the problem. Okay, we have a solution, it's a NoSQL database. Um, so what's wrong with that? Um, so first of all, uh, maintaining a NoSQL database is, is difficult and expensive. Uh, I mean, it's not like, oh, yes, I'm going to, for fun, spin up a Cassandra with six, with six nodes and, and, and just have it uh, uh, run in, like, in a few minutes. Like, I'm going to need to um, maintain it. I'm going to need to populate it. I'm going to need to manage it. Um, so there's a lot of work involved, and this is a critical production piece of my, of my ETL. So if Cassandra isn't working for whatever reason, um, my, my entire ETL stops. Um, or or doesn't get enriched, which might be even worse. Um, so I definitely need to make sure that it's constantly available, that it's performing to spec, that the data in it is fresh. Um, so there's kind of a whole additional ETL pipeline that I need to manage. Uh, in addition to that, to make sure that the that the that the state is is uh, is is working is actually just live. Um, but that's putting aside the concept of data consistency. Um, so when we look at, um, at, at streaming processes in general, so I have my, my, event, my events that are coming in and they're attached to a certain point in time. So like the event was generated at a certain time 
And now I want to join into my state store and I get like, let's say the, uh, let's say, how many times have I seen this user or how many, how many purchases has this user made? Um, so I'm going to join into the state store and I get a number for this user. And that number is correct for a certain point in time. Um, and this state store, like this Cassandra, it doesn't have a concept of time travel. So I'm just getting the state that is now. So if the user up until now, uh, made 17 purchases, I'm going to get the number 17 back. Um, the issue with that is that I have to be very careful about the synchronization between my the stream of data that's feeding the, the Cassandra and the, uh, and the data stream that's being enriched because it very much matters if, if, let's say, the stream going into Cassandra is delayed and I'm getting for my user as well, it's 14 purchases, 14 purchases, and it's not updating. And then suddenly, a while after, it suddenly becomes like 20. Um, but all my data was enriched incorrectly. I'm not going to go back. So now I, I, I just have data that's wrong. And depending what I'm going to use the data for, this can have uh, effects that are between um, annoying and catastrophic. Um, so if... Um, if I'm going to be using this data in order to create some kind of a analytics report and I'm just aggregating over all my users, uh, maybe it means that my numbers are going to be off by like a couple percent. Um, so that's like, you know, it matters, but maybe it doesn't matter that much. Maybe I can live with it. Um, if I'm doing machine learning on top of this and I'm going to be making predictions based on features that are created on top of these joins, then very small changes in the freshness of the data can have very, very large differences in the quality of the prediction. And especially since, I mean, I'm not gonna get too much into the weeds here, but let's say suffice it to say that it can completely ruin your predictions entirely. So that you're you're basically just pre predicting garbage uh, if your stream isn't delayed by the right amount relative to the to the data filling in your, your key value store. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, let's say managing that state uh, m managing the time difference can be quite challenging, even in kind of like when everything's running smoothly. Um, but then you have this other use case where, uh, let's say I am doing machine learning and I want to now build a model. Uh, so I need to go back in time and, and kind of look at the last, let's say, month of data. And I want to pretend to enrich it as though it was enriched in real time, but with a new state store that has, let's say, another couple columns that I didn't have at the time. Um, so now I kind of have to create a simulated world scenario where I'm as if streaming through all the data and populating the Cassandra at the same time uh, in offline, but it has to all be done in lockstep and in a very similar way to how it happens in production, because otherwise the, the numbers are, aren't going to line up. Um, and that's a nightmare. That's something that like super technically difficult to accomplish. Um, and this is maybe like the extreme case when we're talking about machine learning, but it's enough that let's say, I have my analytics database that, that is constantly like one or 2% off and I'm fine with that. Um, but now a bunch of data didn't go through for some reason. And I have this bunch of data that, that, that's from three days ago. Um, and, and I do want to actually get this data because this is already, it's 30% of my data. So I, I, I want to make sure to, to have it added to the, aggregate, uh, to the aggregates, but now it's all gonna join on the state of today. So I'm getting, as if future data relative, future joins relative to the data that just showed up. And that data is, it might be off again by like 30% and I'm putting it into my, my database. And this is now my data. I can't even, I don't have a good way to recover from this kind of issue when I'm talking about streaming data. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to need to maybe have a completely separate pipeline that's not streaming, but it's batch that knows how to deal with these things. That's not working with Cassandra. It's working, working with a completely different state store or doing just a join. But now I have two languages to, to define my join. One of them is done in maybe in Spark using SQL and one of them is joining in code to Cassandra. Maybe they're, are they even doing the same thing? Or like, so there's a lot of complexity here that's kind of latent in, in these kinds of solutions that means that you can have, um, very difficult problems that are very hard to find, very hard to fix, and very hard to understand how much effect they have on the on the value that the data brings you at the end. Um, so I'll pause here for a second. <laughs> um,
does, does this make sense? Uh, are there any questions? I do know, um, maybe I'm wrong about this, but um, maybe exactly once processing is heavily dependent on the state stored uh, in some solutions as well. And uh, do you see that as a limitation for um, same limitation in some of the architecture? Like if if you if you have to rely on a third party for um, exactly once processing, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so first of all, just the fact that you're going out to a state store that isn't linked directly with your data means that you're giving up idempotency. Mm -hmm. um, so it's impossible to do idempotent operations if you're going out to a state store that isn't directly synchronized with your stream. Um, so that's already the fact that you're not idempotent means that you, by definition, cannot do exactly once processing. Uh, it's just impossible. Um, uh, I mean, what that means as far as your architecture um, is is very, let's say, getting into the nitty gritties of like, is it that your files are going to be a bit bigger? So you're going to have overflow into different files or does it mean that your records are going to have missing data or more data or are some records going to get lost? It really depends on kind of how you implemented it. But it's very true that that let's say in the last talk, we talked a lot about, about idempotency and uh, and just the fact that you're going out to a state store that isn't synchronized with your data by necessity means that your transformation is not idempotent. So it means that basically you'll run the same transfer, transformation twice, maybe a few seconds apart, and you're going to get materially different results, which, uh, which can translate into uh, offset errors and all sorts of things like that that, that, that you're going to need to handle and, and deal with later on. Yeah. yeah, which is the big deal when it comes to yeah. you, know, you have a severe data quality issues uh, if um, if that's the case. So um, and another question is that a lot of these uh, architectures were designed um, with uh, like traditionally on prem architecture. That's, uh, uh, you know, whether it's Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, et cetera, uh, and they move that architecture like into the cloud and they still try to improve upon it. Um, so I know that when you design, like this is kind of like what we're doing today, right? Like when you design the architecture for in the cloud from the ground up, you probably have a different way of thinking how to architect this thing. So uh, would you kind of um, share with us what was going through your mind when you want to re-architect all of this in, uh, in the cloud from the ground up? Yeah. Yeah, I think that like, you know, the cloud gives you kind of a benefit that you don't have an on-prem that you can, you can be relatively agnostic to storage. Uh, you don't need storage locality, um, you know, in all the clouds like S3 or containers or whatever it is, um, it's the, the locality doesn't affect performance and the performance is super good. It's like very, very, very fast. Um, so, so that makes a lot of design decisions that, that you would normally make. And, and it's true, all these systems like Cassandra was built for on-prem deployments. Um, so, so a lot of design decisions around like how I'm going to manage my data um, are, are basically just wrong. Like you're not gaining a lot of value from having data local to a server when you could just be bringing it from S3. If it's just a file that's immutable anyways, um, it's really just a limitation, you could say. Um, and I think that the, the volume of data also matters a lot. So like if you're used to paying, um, like the equivalent of a thousand dollars a month per terabyte, um, then, then you're going to make decisions based on that, um, of how, like, can you even store historic states or how far back can you store things like that? Um, and, and that also means that like systems are designed that way. So like, you don't have that option of time travel really. Because like nobody thought that you're going to have, you know, petabytes of storage that are just freely available, kind of. Uh, whereas in the lake, it's completely elastic. You don't have to commit in advance. So, so it's very easy to say, well, I'm just going to keep the older states because, uh, you know, it's cheap and it's easy and, and, and it'll, be, it'll probably be useful later on. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's like kind of a fundamental difference in the design that you look at storage as something that, that you're conceptually constantly like updating the state and then deleting the old files uh, versus um, I have a, a lake of data that I'm constantly adding more information to it, but I don't need to delete the old states and I can always go back and use those if, if the underlying systems support that. Um, I think that's the, the fundamental difference when you look at how Upsolver handles state management is that the, it's really, it's two things. It's first of all, that the state is all sitting in S3. So what that gives you is the ability to fully time travel very easily. 
Um, so all the state is there, it's not going anywhere, and it's very easy to just load up whatever snapshot in history that you want to. And, and again, it's cheap, like it's not, you, it, it's not costing you a lot of money in order to, in order to ha provide that service. Um, and the, um, the second part is that the state is built on top of the streams. So this synchronicity between a certain version of the state and a certain ETL process or a certain point in a stream or a certain event, that synchronicity is actually very hard to accomplish when it's two separate systems that are managing it. Um, I mean, it really kind of like once it separates, it's very hard to communicate because these are two live things that like they're always moving forward. So I kind of making sure to kind of align one point here with one point here is, is very, very difficult traditionally. And if you have a system that manages it all for you, so it's all built under the same uh, kind of under the same roof. So you have actually very easy synchronization because you have kind of very fixed checkpoints in Upsolver, it's once a minute. So you have a checkpoint once a minute and you're always gonna check, you're gonna join to the state that's matching that same minute of data. So, so kind of the synchronization happens automatically. You don't even need to think about it. It's not part, it's not even part of your language. You're not specifying it, it's just gonna happen um, just because of the way the state is managed and, and the way ETLs look. Um, so that's a, that's a very big, uh, I think, difference as far as just the concept of, of is the state kind of an external thing that's, that's happening that you need to kind of manage somewhere else and make sure to synchronize, or is it part of your system and then it's just synchronized automatically without, without needing to do anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And also like, uh, uh, when it's an external system, I think people do need to understand what kind of memory utilization they're having, what kind of disk um, utilization they're having, disk I.O., how many, I think, open files is the problem. Could be they have to tune that. So how, uh, in your mind, like, uh, you know, like, how do you make this automated so the users don't need to worry about those things? So um, Upsolver takes a kind of very specific approach to managing state. Uh, we say that all the state is sitting in S3. Um, and we use a very, uh, we use a, a relatively unique file format that allows us to load a lot of state into memory in a single server. Um, so that just gives us kind of a leg up and allows us to, to work with much more data in memory at any given point in time. Um, which helps with with kind of locality and the ability to do a lot of uh, um, let's say very fast or or very many operations on very large states. Um, so again, like I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds, um, but uh, like we can probably have another session just on that. Um, but uh, but I think that like kind of the um, the fact that we that we allow you to have a lot more data in memory. Um, postpones the issue of needing to manage kind of like, you know, file handles or things like that to the point where, where it's just not a problem. Um, so when you're using Upsolver, you just have state and you can just use it whenever you want to. Um, you're never really thinking about, well, how big is my state and, and where did it come from and, and what's going to happen? Whereas if it's, I mean, if it's an external system, then, then you do actually just need to manage it. You need to have it live. I mean, state in Upsolver isn't live, it sits in S3. Um, so, so I can have all my servers disappear and then they'll come back an hour or later and, and they'll just start loading the state from S3 just as though they would otherwise. Um, whereas with a live system, it, it actually just has to be live. It's not like linked to the ETL process in a, in a very uh, uh, deep way that would allow you to, to have them uh, maintained together. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So do you see like the future, like the, uh, basically um, what it sounds like is because of the way Upsolver built this uh, state system from the ground up that scales with S3, that you haven't really seen any performance issues, uh, that it scales with workload, that doesn't need external management of any kind. Um, so moving forward, uh, this is probably the architecture that you you believe that is going to scale, is going to um, make management really easy for users and also very reliable. Would that be a correct um, uh, say? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like there isn't a disadvantage to this architecture. So I definitely see that like, you know, going forward, the world is going to move more towards 
uh, these kind of distributed uh, uh, storage only models. Uh, you do see this, by the way, starting with like, you know, Kafka having a spillover test three and like these things are happening. Um, it's just slow because a lot of these systems were built as an on-prem first type system. Um, I think that like, you know, uh, uh, the systems that started on the cloud, that they were cloud first, um, they have a huge leg up as far as kind of their underlying architectures. And you kind of see that with like which successful companies you have now um, uh, that, that, that when they started in the cloud, it's a lot easier for them to kind of have performance advantages and cost advantages uh, versus their competitors. So I think that that's definitely something that we're going to see more of. Uh, but it's a very slow process because switching from uh, from a kind of a, the storage is on my server and I have to think about kind of data locality to I have access to all the data in the world and it's super cheap. It's it's a very fundamental shift um, mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of time for for systems to migrate. But the new systems don't have uh, uh, don't have that problem because they started, and I think that this is pretty uh, like pretty obvious today that people building are building cloud first and they're building with these concepts in mind. Yeah. Yeah. So like in our mind, this is what cloud native actually means is <laughs> a, is really. Yeah, your... exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. Uh, Shatana, do you have any uh, questions for you? I just want to say that, you know, this, uh, these brown bag sessions really feel like they're for me <laughs> because this is only my second week here. So I'm learning a lot about the product. And, you know, as May said, uh, for, for someone who's relatively new to streaming um, architectures, this is, you know, a fantastic way for me to learn how, what the history has been, how, how the solutions uh, have looked like in the past and what it's going to look like in the future. So I know it's not for me, and I hope, but I really hope that other people will take away as much as I am. Thank you so much, Ioni, for spending some time with us. And I look forward to share um, all of your knowledge with our audience in our next um, Brown Bag session. So thank you both for taking time today, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much.